Photography is usually associated with the act of seeing, like modern painting. It was born in connection with science as a tool for recording the results of neutral observation. On the other extreme, photography has to do with visual hunting. The photographer has an intrinsic power over its observable subjects, and this power becomes part of the picture making. In both cases, either disappearing from or prevailing over a subject, what is central to this type of visual work is capturing a more or less aware and or recognizable object in order to show it to viewers in different times and places. But photography can also be considered in a whole different way. A first step is to focus on the connection between things, the rhythm of the scene, as opposed to the identity of the objects out there. The act of photographing can then be performed with a paradoxical stance using a framing instrument in order to unframe, that is to explore one's own capacity to see. Moving one step further from this kind of systemic approach, photography can be undertaken as a way to work not only on vision and perception, but on a more general state of being, reminding and refining one's own capacity to be present, therefore aware about what is there and open to what will be next learning to be in a definite space and time and ready for internal and external events to happen. When I first started working with Alice, the, um, I realized that one of the biggest constraints in science was the, the focus without the loss of peripheral vision, basically. And I, I realized that poetic language is the linguistic equivalent of photography. So we began to work together on some projects, some in scientific journals, that was the first one, and then this photography. Um, you will first see the series of photographs uh, called A La Terra, and uh, then I will read what those photographs evoked in me. And then we will go to the, the scientific uh, cover one.
The newborn opens his eyes to the light. There are no words for the laughing wonder of four fingers, one hand, a bassinet. Later there will come a vaulted expectation at a chair where light is seated awaiting darkness, where knowledge awaits wisdom, where an unseen man awaits her touch. How can I countenance the fearful grief of her symmetry, of seeing, being seen, and still not seeing, of letting go, of holding? How can I turn your head? How can I cock my own? I could be happy just skittling like a spindly branch over the cobbles. And here at just this angle, at just this height, the dog in me wags his tail. He can see between the balustrades a river, between the mannequins a wind chime of legs. Piss on it the wall, just for relief, and to see the stone grimace helplessly at my happiness. Beyond the stones, the trees hedge in. This side, the sky opens, where trees lean together, speaking softly to the wind. No words are sufficient. A wrinkled stone cupping rainfall on a hot day, an offering by the waters from the mountain, by the dark and empty shelves of all the trees we have sacrificed for all we know, she wept. In the library of what is lost when all is gained, I lay down and dreamed of thee, Sion. The old one closes her eyes to the light. There are no words sufficient for this soft shawl of departing. I want to come with you. There is a path by the wall to the bleak and beautiful peaks of the bright and bitter gods, the eroticism of ice clefts, the lovely dendrites of their unthinking being. But not yet, not yet. I do not wish at my death to say, I was here, passed by, saw this and that, a tree, a rock, a baby, a poem, an observation here, an explanation there. I want to declare, yes, yes I do, in sickness and in health, that I overstayed my welcome, that I fell topsy-turvy into the toppled world's embrace, and by my last breath spoke, I am here. Our first collaboration was for a cover of a Springer Journal, of all things, um, called EcoHealth. And they, they mangled the cover a bit. Uh, we're trying to uh, sort of re, uh, reclaim it. Um, and we wrote an essay together about this picture, The Bleating Heart. The photographer has been sleeping for the longest time, exhausted from traveling in a windstorm. She awakes at noon and leaves the village for a walk. Seeking relief, shade, the photographer ventures into the woods. The path crumbles into a blanched gully of dry soil and roots, very steep. Her sandals, useless here, are pulled off. She feels the solidarity and reassuring pain of the earth against her bare skin. The camera is heavy and bulky. She doubts her own intention to carry it there. Why can't she just experience? There is no need to justify her presence there, yet she feels that need. We did not ask to be here. We did not choose this life we have, this planet, and yet somehow we feel the need to justify. The goat is small, tiny, utterly dark. Has she seen something? In her still darkness, she is aware of something. At times, she bleats into bright silence. She is lost, maybe or the photographer is lost. The kid looks fragile, out of balance. Still, her bleating is firm. She knows how to be alive here. Do we? The photographer stops, takes a picture. By photographing, we can grab a moment of reality, showing what is there, enabling us to name, catalog, separate, objectify. But we can also photograph to witness the emergence of a connection, something quite mysteriously happening within ourselves, a moment of openness, an instant of awareness of our own being there, alive among other things. In that awareness, a sudden deeper connection is felt with all there is. Look again. In the blanched earth amid drought, we look for the tree to find water, our connection to the earth. And the animal, a fellow animal, the small black bleating heart of us, flora and fauna. And again, we lay back in the shade with the satyrs, celebrating our bodies, our profligacy, falling like Debussy into the lazy afternoon of a fawn. 
We flute and dance with the old goat, Pan, oldest of the domesticated food animals, 10,000 years of uneasy marriage. In goats, we celebrate our most ancient connections to this planet, this place. We sacrifice the Yule goat. Do we, like Thor, whose carriage was pulled by goats who ate their meat every night and saw them rise again from their bones every morning, do we honor the bones? And again, in that most ancient of zodiacs, the Chinese, the goat and sheep commingle and return to their evolutionary unity, charming and creative, elegant and fond of nature. Who was born in the year of the goat? Michelangelo, Mark Twain, Thomas Alva Edison, Muhammad Ali, Rudolph Valentino, Rachel Carson, Pierre Trudeau, Barbara Walters, Orville Wright, Nicole Kidman, Julia Roberts, Amy Lee, Bruce Willis, Benicio del Toro, Claire Danes, Jamie Lynn Spears, Matt LeBlanc, Chao Yun Fat, Zhang Zi Yi, Li Shi Min, Chao Chao, Yu Fei, Empress Dowager, Qi Shi. Can you find a pattern? The pattern is human. This is all of us, the sheep goat, lost in the phantasmagoria of our imaginations, in the bleakness of the landscape we create. In the Western zodiac, the Capricorn is a chimera, a modern goat, genetically manipulated, fishtailing up to the mountaintop. We are all Capricorns, ambitious children of Descartes, who wished nothing less for his kids, for us, than to be the lords and possessors of nature. Look again, see the tree? all that firewood to split. The great unnamed demands that we split ourselves, demands a sacrificial lamb. Two goats are chosen, one has his throat slit, one zigzags free into the desert, the scapegoat. The goats go to hell, the sheep to the heavenly fold. Descartes' dualism rules. All we like sheep have gone astray. We wander lost at the edge of the light, looking into the oasis. The tree is there, the deep roots to the depths of the drought, to the source. The goat, the heart of us, the little black heart, bleating. There go our kids, our future. We see a tree, a small black animal. Our primal connections to the planet, to each other. We see water, food, clothing, shade, milk, meat, skin, a scapegoat for our abuse. What are we willing to sacrifice and for whom? Whose kid is that? Does it matter? We speak of one health and health for all, but who are we? And what sacrifices of others' health is demanded by a sense of entitlement for our own? In the trust of sharing food and water, we find ourselves. When the wind dies and the clouds hold their watery breath, in that open, dry silence, we hear the voices of those who dwell with us. Antonio Gaudi sipped goat's milk for his health. Brucella melitensis swimming in the milk. Suffering thrives in the very material of life. Is this not at the heart of our dilemma? That the very things that give us health and life also remind us of our mortality? The WHO in its 1948 constitution says that health is not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, but a state of complete physical and social well-being. Can it be that sometimes social well-being thrives on infirmity? In the grip of undulant fever, unconsciously carrying the contradictory and complex image in his body, Gaudi imagined the Sagrada Familia, a celebration of the complex and contradictory connections among all living things. But come back and look again. See the white, hard earth, the tree, the broken path. Pause a moment. The wind bates its breath, burning hot. That ancient conversation, air and fire, the hot breath of being and memory riffling the hair on her arms. On such a day, we are struck dumb.